the only party we know that has something to say about this is the W. So you can tell that uh, from a theorist perspective, it is quite intriguing. And there is this kind of, you could call it bias, but there is this kind of um, 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 connection that people make when they see an anomaly like this. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? I hope you're having a wonderful Friday and have a fantastic weekend planned. Physicists at Fermilab have just released a painstaking analysis of CDF2 experimental data that suggests that the mass of a fundamental subatomic particle of nature, the W boson, is slightly more massive than we would expect it to be given the predictions of the standard model of particle physics and past experimental data. The result is the most precise measurement of the W boson mass ever produced, and is more precise than all previous measurements combined. Although the discrepancy between the W boson's predicted mass and this new measurement is tiny in absolute terms, it is incredibly statistically significant and represents the first conclusive experimental result that is at odds with the standard model. However, the result is in strong tension with measurements from other experiments such as ATLAS and LHCB at CERN and came as a shock even to the Fermilab scientists themselves. The international particle physics community is now considering, debating and checking the result. If the result is accurate, the implications for fundamental physics are enormous. Cracks in the standard model will help scientists to pinpoint where to look for new physics and potentially lead us to explanations for unknown phenomena such as dark matter, dark energy, and even the origins of the universe itself. To help us dig more into the theory behind this measurement and its potential implications in theory, we welcome a fantastic special guest, Professor Martin Bauer. Professor Bauer is a theoretical particle physicist who also works on quantum sensors and dark matter. He's an associate professor at Durham and a science board member for the Science and Technology Facilities Council, STFC. So who better to help us dig into and understand the potential theoretical implications of CDF's latest measurement? So, Professor Bauer, first question. We've got this, this blockbuster... Um, new result from CDF, which suggests the W boson mass might be a little bit higher than we expected. First up, for the people out there who are who are not so familiar with particle physics, what is the W boson and why is it important? Because a lot of people won't be aware of it, but it is very important in their everyday lives, isn't it? Yes, the W boson is an important particle. It is a force carrier, so it belongs to the to the particles that mediate a force. Very Other right. particles that do this are the the photon, for example, or the graviton, if you could eventually find it. <laughs> um, and it is, it is responsible for the um, weak force, and it's named weak because it is, uh, especially at low energies, comparably weak, um, if, you, if you compare it with a strong nuclear force, for example, or even electromagnetism. Mm. And the reason for that is precisely the mass of the W. Mm. Um, so on a, on a, a fundamental level, if you have massive force carriers, their range is limited, and therefore the interaction are suppressed with that mass so if the more massive these force carriers are the um, less important if you will or the less the less strong is the force that mm. they mediate but um, the w is so very important because it has a unique property that all, mm. all the other force carriers don't have mm. so with the picture you have just up there you see that the fermions in the standard model are more than the ones that um, you have in your everyday life yeah i mean most people don't worry about quarks in their everyday <laughs> life either yeah the you you know, and your um, listeners too, that all the quarks um, that um, are usually present in a proton and a neutron mm. are up and down quarks. Yeah. And the only lepton we worry about is the electron, really. Mm. But they have heavier cousins. Yeah. And the W is the only particle that can switch between these. Yeah. So, for example, if you want a process where, say, a strange quark turns into a down quark, that can only happen to the W. Mm. So, all these heavier cousins are around and um, they decay. Particles made of them decay. The muon, for example, decays into an electron and, um, and the corresponding neutrinos. And that all these decays would never happen 
mm. if the W wasn't around. So a neutron would never turn into a, um, a proton. The muon would never decay. So the consequence is actually um, quite more important than people realize in their mm. everyday life. The universe would look very, very different <laughs> if the W wasn't there. So, so yeah, imagine in the in the early phase of the universe, all these heavy particles were produced copiously, right? The, yeah. The early universe, the Big Bang was a hot soup with a lot of energy. So you had all these guys around, strange quarks, bottom quarks, top quarks, everything, right? There was a lot of them. And then they bound into composite particles. And they would all be there if it wasn't for the W. So <laughs> you would have at least like you would have copies of of, uh, of matter that would be heavier, and you would have structures made of those. The universe would look very, very different um, if the W wasn't there. So it's a very it's a fundamentally important particle to explain the world um, as we observe it. And, and some some things that it's involved with today, so radioactive decay, things like this, flavor changing, as you say, between different types of particles, the burning, quote unquote, of the sun, for example, very important with the W. So very, very important particle that we that we understand and we understand its mass, because, as you say, that controls how strong this this force is going to be. So <clears throat> why do we care so much about the mass of the W? You mentioned it there that it, it leads into the the sort of strength of the. Um, of the weak interaction how do we constrain it in particle physics theory how do we get an idea of what that mass is going to be or what we think that mass should be from from kind of first principles so the um so, so from first principles it's difficult in the sense that mm. there are some fundamental parameters that are measured then enter the w some. mass so you can uh, use either they can measure w mass directly or you can measure, yeah, you have the equations up there right now. Yeah. So you can measure the gauge couplings, the interactions of the W, which is this small g in this equation, and the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs boson, which mm. is the small um, v that you have in this equation. So these relations, this link between these relations are fixed by the Higgs mechanism. They are mm. prediction of the Higgs mechanism. And because you can do many different experiments to measure either one of these, mm. um, they are over-constrained. So um, meaning you can, for example, um, measure the lifetime of the muon, which is the main low energy way to derive the, um, the mass of the W. As we said, this, the interaction strength mm. is determined by this mass. And therefore, the heavier it is, the longer it takes, for example, for the muon to decay. Mm. So if you measure the lifetime precisely, you get the left-hand side of this equation. Yeah. Um, and and similarly you can there's a there's a so-called electroweak fit so you can um, use the three parameters to fit an enormous range of measurements it's been done at, at maybe yeah, got exactly. one of these yeah and here you can see that if when you vary the top mass and the w what this would imply for the higgs mass this plot is, has been produced before the higgs was discovered so that was an indirect way for us to figure out what kind of higgs mass is uh, realistic and uh, which is not so um, there, there's a bunch of ways to determine the W mass. And the, the way it has been done at uh, CMS is one of the most direct ways, but actually mm. producing the W boson, mm. letting it decay and reconstruct the mass that you get from this mm. decay. So so all of these sort of electroweak measurements, the mass of the W, the mass of the top, the mass of the Z, which we can recreate from, from EE, for example, they all sort of constrain one another. And if one is too far off, that has a kind of knock-on effect down the line, and the the model sort of doesn't work anymore. Does is that is that a fair a fair characterization? Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a very delicate building the mm -hmm. standard model where <laughs> where every one of these parameters has to precisely fit for it to work. So if you start to wiggle on one of them, right, <laughs> then you get big question marks on on other measurements that depend on this parameter. Yeah. So how well do we understand them, right? So for example, again, if you if you want to discuss in terms of this uh, fit that you show here then uh, what it tells you is the measurement at lab one and lab two prefer these values to lie in these ellipses, the green and the red one, right? So that, that is a preference for certain W mass mm -hmm. and a certain top mass. And um, the Higgs mass enters as well. So the, the diagonal lines that you see here is if you vary the Higgs mass. Yeah. So now, for example, imagine we had found the Higgs that is has a mass of 1000 GeV. That was the upper rightmost yeah, line. Over, over here, here right? somewhere, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would imply that what we learned about the W in the top had to be wrong. Yeah. And similarly, you know, if you change the W mass, right, that, that you could get into a value that does not agree with this ellipse anymore. Mm. And that is pretty much what happened um, with the CMS measurement. The CMS measurement does not really agree with the previous measurements mm. um, that we had of the W mass. So Neither our, the low so our new W there. mass is up here somewhere in this in this diagram, which is outside of these these kind of overlaps. Yeah, so you, there would be a tension between 
what you had from the previous fits and the previous direct measurements and this measurement. Very, very interesting. So, so yeah, there's a lot of attention, uh, tension between previous measurements and this, this new measurement. So the, the new measurement is only sort of, is only sort of 50, is it 50 MeV higher than the, the accepted value at the moment, just to give people a sort of That's idea. It. It's a per mil shift. It's a tiny shift of the, mm. um, of the WMR. So it will not have huge implications on everyday processes, which obviously um, we would have noticed, <laughs> we would have recognized before if that was the case. Right? But, but uh, that is not that is not a good argument to to um, dismiss it as unimportant, right? Yes. So, so often often in science you start seeing tiny discrepancies that uh, are first hint of something much much more important, much mm -hmm. deeper. So a famous example is. Um, the, the procession of the perihel of mercury, right? That mm. was first recognized in the 19th century. And that is tiny. It's like, it's l way less than a per mil per year. Mm. So that maybe I should, so the, the, the mercury um, rotates about the sun. It's not a perfect circle, it's an ellipse. And there's a point of clo closest approach to the sun. And in, in Newton's theory, you would expect that this basically does not move or mm. does move very little. That point is basically the same point every year. Yeah. But um, um, astrophysicists have noticed that it's it, it a very slow movement over hundreds of years by a fraction of a degree. And um, uh, you could then say, well, now all the other measurements that you have, the other planets seem to be fine. There's <laughs> such a tiny contribution. Why would you worry about this? Yeah. But we know how, how this story ends because that was, that was the main first experimental hint that uh, general relativity uh, may be right because mm. they predicted this shift correctly based on Einstein's theory. Mm. So um, you never know um, whether or not a tiny um, yeah. shift like here the W mass might have giant implications down the road. Yeah. That's why it's so important to uh, pay attention to those. So it has a it's, it's small in absolute terms, but in, according to the the experiment that they've done, it's very significant. So it's, it's like a seven sigma shift, right. I think, which which suggests they are seeing something now it could be that there's a systematic that hasn't been considered or it could be a real a real thing that's going on in the physics but they are seeing something so saying it's just a small shift you have to kind of normalize that with with how significant it is um compared to what we what we expect and it is a very significant shift as you as you kind of say so i guess there's uh there's a kind of elephant in the room when we uh when we think about these measurements so <clears throat> Previous measurements from uh, so this is a, an official plot now from LHCb, which was was my old experiment um, several years ago. Um, old experiments of the of the W mass from LHCb, from Atlas, from Let, from D zero, from the old Tevatron measurement, they all seem to kind of agree with one another more or less. Although there are wider error bars and more with the standard model than the than the CDF measurement that does the new one. What what should we make of this the shift in your in your opinion? What should we make of this discrepancy? So this is the big um, question mark, right? So so um, these are all these are very serious scientists, and uh, I just talked about this yesterday with colleagues. Mm -hmm. If you have a collaboration like CDF that spend a long time mm -hmm. on a very complicated measurement, yeah. and they they come out and say we've got a seven sigma discrepancy, yeah. which means basically we are very very confident yeah. about um, our errors. Then you can't just dismiss this. No, it's, no, no. it's not like they uh, um, did not a very careful job to examine the errors. But obviously, um, it, the fact that there are previous measurements that are so far off, right? There's also like a four sigma between this combination and the um, the CDF measurement, I believe. Um, you you can. Uh, um, there's always the, the the big question whether some weird systematic systematics has been underestimated. So there, there, there's so many, and and I watched your <laughs> um, talk, Rika, and you yeah. went into quite some detail. It would be a very great um, discussion. So there's <laughs> so many possible error sources yeah. that it is always possible if you have a discrepancy like this that something has been missed. And uh, so um, I think if we bring up the paper just to sort of make your point, I think they've got a, a grey box down here which goes starts going into systematics, and then when I talked to one of the the CDF scientists a couple of uh, weeks ago, they were like. Yeah, and these are only the uh, the most important ones. There's another fifty pages right. of expert, you know, behind the scenes systematics that have been done. So there's an insane amount of things that they have to understand. And I think Mika went into detail that they they sort of th fall into three boxes. One is uh, theoretical errors in the model that they use. One is backgrounds, and then the other one uh, it's kind of statistics of, of of what they're doing, and then understanding your detector as well. So there's a hell of a lot of 
different places that the errors can enter in potential systematics can enter in that that need to be understood right it's it's a it's a it's a huge amount of work and um there might well be something um where this where this value starts to um that the error bars uh, start to increase in the future mm. but it is significantly off and it's not clear that um the big question would eventually be whether um, once experimentalists understand this better, whatever your blue real value is from the direct measurements mm. does agree or not with the green that we see here that yeah. comes from the electric. Yeah. And that yeah. might that might still be the case, right? Even if you're um, uh, careful about what they have found, it could well be that the combination, maybe the new Atlas or um, uh, CMS results once they uh, have more precise measurements, yeah. shifts yeah. everything that is blue in this plot a bit to the right. Yeah. And that is the right. discrepancy we would be interested in, right? Because that would tell us that it cannot just be the Higgs alone, um, in a sense, that is responsible for this um, for this mass. But there must be something else going on. Mm. I think. I think uh, was it Matthias? Matthias shot. I think he did a a very quick combination of the of the previous measurements and said there was there was a kind of a four sigma tension between. Um, that's not an official value, but about a four sigma tension between these previous measurements and the and the new CDF. So I guess the. The first thing to understand, as as Mika sort of um, talked about last week, is why is there a tension between these measurements before we kind of run off and start saying, okay, this is the new value, let's let's do everything downstream from there. Is that is that fair? Yeah, that's definitely the highest priority, and I expect that experimentalists at LHC and the CDF collaboration will uh, will stick their heads together and, and uh, <laughs> figure this out in the, in the upcoming month. Uh, and years, but is, we shouldn't expect this to happen fast. No. Again, it took a decade to to complete this analysis. It's one. If you had asked me even before this was published, just what what would I would think is the most complicated experimental measurement, <laughs> I would probably have said the W mass. It's really really difficult yeah. um, to pin that down because the W tends to decay into things we neutrinos we can't directly detect. Yeah. So it's really really hard to do that, and it will be equally hard to figure out if. Um, and what the discrepancy is, is responsible for this discrepancy in the end. I was uh, I was reading a blog post from uh, from Matthias Schott again, and I, I, talking about things that can affect this W boson mass, mass measurement. Things like the thermal expansion of the detector, the the weight of the detector kind of sagging certain detector components down over time, the the wiggling around parton distribution functions inside the protons and the sort of tiny changes of angle that that does for the for the energy of interaction. The, it is such a delicate and difficult measurement that, like you say, I can't see anyone going, oh, you've obviously done this wrong. Go back and look at this. It's going to be a, a very intricate um, long-term process to try and work out why these discrepancies are happening between these very different machines. Yeah, and that is that is also what I want to why I want to emphasize that the one main point we can take away at the moment from the situation as it is, is that you need to continuously fund these analysis. Mm, yeah. Because if they hadn't, the, the Tevatron isn't running for the last decade, right? This yeah. is all analysis of all data. And all data. Yeah. But if they hadn't had funding for that, if that wasn't pushed, um, there there's a, maybe there's a hint for new physics hidden in this. Yes. And there would have been absolutely no way to figure it out if we hadn't gone there. So this is, uh, uh, as of now, we should not jump on it with any <laughs> conclusion or preliminary conclusion. I mean, as, as theorists, we can we can dream and we can try to understand the structure of new theories. That would be we're we're going to come on to that, don't worry. That's what we're right. going to have a go. <laughs> no, ex ex but, exactly um, correct. But I think at the moment, we should really um, uh, praise CDF to accomplish this yeah. and, uh, um, and, and, and see that the implica implication of that is that you really need um, the money to do that, even if your experiment is already done, um, if you want to learn these details. Exactly right. You're going to get no no complaint from me on, on on that score. More money for fundamental science, particle physics, always a always a good idea in in my book. So, you you sort of nicely segued into that um, for me. So thank you very much. So <clears throat> there is a question, and Mika was uh, a little bit cheeky, as us uh, experimentalists can be, calling it ambulance chasing. But when we have a a little uh, discrepancy like this, um, we do tend to see papers appearing on archive and ideas of, of what the structure of these um, theories might be that could explain these discrepancies if they were real. So let's say that this measurement from uh, CDF is, is entirely accurate. And this is the new W boson mass. It's, it's 50 MeV higher than we predicted from our electroweak fit from the predictions of the um, standard model and, and those experimental values. 
what could potentially be causing this? What what kind of new phenomena, new particles are people considering as as ideas that that, that might explain this shift? Right. So so first, with regards to um, and be uh, gentle um, with me because I, I've been out of the theoretical will, game for will, a while. Yeah. I will try my best. You, you should stop me if, it's, uh, <laughs> if I'm getting too far from um, what, whatever is um, a good explanation for yeah. the for the podcast. Mm. But what I wanted to um, say first about the ambulance chasing, I think there's a reason why people do this. Mm. It's not that um, there's an opportunity to um, uh, to just change a parameter and uh, present your favorite new yeah, physics yeah, model. Yeah. Um, now, as I said, it will take a long, long time whether we get a resolution on this or not. And if you can pin down the structures yeah. that are potentially responsible for it, mm -hmm. you might be able to um, find a way to test them faster. Yeah. Like, for example, if, if you have an, a different implication of this in your new physics model, it might be um, there might be a way to test that yeah. well before they have settled the W mass. There so might be an experimental saying, signature that we could look for with with okay. existing detectors yeah. or or maybe new detectors, which one of which you're working on, which we can discuss next week, but there might be yeah, a way that we can yeah, actually yeah. get more resolution on this and that and that interplay between the, the theory and experiment. Which which then in turn might trigger experimentalists to jump on this and, and do this specific measurement and yeah. again be faster with that than a very difficult calculation or measurement than the than the W mass. Yeah. So I, I think there's actually a, a purpose in that as well. Um, um, although I agree, the fact that uh, um, hundreds of papers are being produced so close <laughs> to the measurement is not necessarily um, uh, necessary to for, for, to make that point. We, we, we like to have but people. People part. should know that there's always this little cheeky sort of, uh, you know, interplay between experimentalists and theorists. We're always trying to get one up on each other. So it's all it's all a little bit of fun. It's not it's not it's not a serious uh, it's not a serious dig. It's all it's all in good fun. Yeah. Definitely. So, so what kind of new physics could be responsible for this? Um, so uh, mainly the most important fact that we should um, maybe first clarify is the relation between the W mass and the Z boson mass and their interaction strength, mm. as we said before, is fixed by the Higgs mechanism. So that is the standard model prediction of how these quantities are related. Mm. And in particular, the, the, um, the difference in the W mass has not been observed in the Z boson mass, mm. right? These three are cousins. They all are relevant mm. for the weak force. Um, if the if there is just some uncertainty in Higgs couplings, for example, that are responsible for that, you would expect them to shift together and yeah. not just one of them instead of the others. So in order for that to happen, so the Z boson something. mass we can measure quite quite accurately, right? Because we have the we can measure it from EE or mu mu, and we yeah. can be quite confident about that that part of the equation. Is that is that kind of where you're where what you sort of explaining there? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. So the so the Z boson is is they are it's related to the W, but mm -hmm. because it only uh, it, it decays into charged particles yeah. only, it's experimentally it's quite the opposite. Like the <laughs> as far as I know, Z, they they use it to calibrate the beam at the LHC. Yeah. So it's something that's really well understood and it's really straightforward. Like. It, it's Compared to the question. W, it's very very yeah. It's always like the first one of the first. Um, you know, uh, university calculations I was given to do and and these yeah, kind of exactly. things because it's it's quite a clean, it's quite a clean thing yeah, to look at. Yeah. So we know the Z mass didn't shift and the W mass spec is a speculation. If that is true, it would shift, right? Mm. So you would need some kind of new physics that is capable of distinguishing between the two mm. in a different way mm. than the standard model Higgs boson. And um, the, the most direct way is to introduce a new particle that contributes to the breaking. Mm. So the Higgs boson breaks a symmetry. The symmetry is between the, um, the W and Z bosons and the, and the electromagnetic photon. And if the Higgs boson wasn't there, they would all be massless mm. degrees of freedom, they would all behave like a photon more or less. But the Higgs boson is responsible for breaking that symmetry mm. and not interchangeable in any way after that. And you can clearly identify them. Yeah. But uh, there is a difference between Z boson and Ws as well. And that is that the Ws are charged, electromagnetically charged particles themselves. The Z and the photon both are uncharged particles. So it's, it's possible to break this in a way um, to contribute to the breaking that shifts the charged bosons away from the mass of the, um, the uncharged bosons, mm. if you will. Or maybe the, the most direct way of saying that. And uh, that kind of new Higgs boson you would need for that would be different from the Higgs that we have. It would transform in a different way. It would be a different theoretical beast than the Higgs boson we, we have in the standard model. So, so would, would we be saying that there's another there's another kind of field in the background, like the Higgs field as well? What, what would we, and therefore it has its yeah. own 
its own boson that goes along with it. We just haven't seen it yet. Would that be the kind right. of idea there? Yeah, exactly. The Higgs boson is it's kind of a puzzle why there's only one Higgs boson. We seem to have copies of every every meta field in the standard <laughs> model. Um, but one Higgs boson is like the economic solution. It's enough. It can do the job, right? Yeah. It cannot do the job if you include this CDF measurement. Yeah. Then you need a different kind of Higgs boson that shifts it. Mm. Um, so so that would that would be one that would be the most direct way of explaining it. You would had a different like background field that uh, that has a non-zero um, value in the vacuum that shifts differently the, the W mass and the Z boson mass, for example, something the Higgs boson by itself cannot do. If that split between the masses that we observe would be huge, it's not, it's a tiny effect. Mm. If it would be huge, we would need an effect like this, yeah. right? We would need such a new vacuum expectation value of a new field to responsible for the shift. In other words, it had to be um, like an almost classical, a direct effect that you can understand without any quantum physics. It has yeah. to be a sizable effect yeah, on yeah. Uh, in that case. But it's not. It's a tiny effect. So it doesn't have to be um, such, a, such a direct breaking that is responsible for it. You could also have um, what is called a loop um, contribution. Mm -hmm. So you could have new particles that, down here that uh, down give here. a different... Yeah, something like this, for example, right? So what, what is drawn here is a W boson that starts traveling through space and time from one end to the other. And uh, then it interacts with all these different background fields, mm -hmm. right? And it does so directly with the with the Higgs, but indirectly with anything that is charged and interacts with this. These are these called um, uh, um, uh, bubbles that are in these diagrams. The loops in the diagrams signify that. So if you calculate the W mass, you get these contributions. And if you have different loops um, of this kind for the W and the Z boson, mm -hmm. again, you, you will contribute to a shift in one sector, but not in the other. Yeah. And that can be achieved by uh, many different new physics scenarios. So one that would be straightforward is if you have a spin zero field there, the charged one, that could be part of a more complex Higgs sector as well. That is different from what I tried to describe before, because in this case, um, this charged Higgs um, is, is not a field that has a, a background value, mm. but it just occurs in these loops mm. and contributes that way. But it doesn't have to be a scalar. It could be a, um, a fermion as well. Mm. And that is that is interesting also because um, fermions of this kind that have this property, so spin one half particles mm. that uh, could contribute to the splitting of the W and Z boson mass, they um, are a dark matter candidate. They mm. weakly interact with massive particles is what they are called. And people have searched for them for a long time. Yeah. Um, it, when, when I say they've searched for them a long time, it implies they haven't found them yet. <laughs> so um, yeah, some people that still hold out hope that the dark matter particle uh, might be there with these properties. Yeah. But for large couplings and light masses, this is what is easiest to test. Mm. They have not been found, right? So you would expect them to be rather heavy and uh, rather weakly coupled, but that would make for a tiny effect. So the, the small effect that we see in the W might be in fact an indirect uh, um, uh, effect of that kind from some dark matter sector, for example, right? So now, now when you have this palette of different possibilities, um, the, the work of the theorist is to figure out what are the consequences of either one of them? How would you distinguish them? Because obviously you can find ways for all of them to explain the, um, the W mass. Yeah. And, and that is what we were talking about before. You're now writing down these degrees of freedom and there's a, there are massive differences in how a charged scalar behaves from a yeah. charged fermion, for example, and how you would discover them. So then, then when you look at the papers that appear now, they are mostly worried um, about these um, new ways of uh, figuring out what could be the underlying theory. And, and as you say, if you understand some ideas of what the underlying theories could be, maybe we can think of some ideas of how to test them. And, it, and it's always nice. It's always nice if a theory can answer more than one question, right? You mentioned there that some of these uh, theories have uh, dark matter candidates, so stable, weakly interacting particles. So if you can answer more than more than one problem, seemingly with the standard model, that makes a theory even more um, attractive to uh, to the whole community. Yeah, it's it's um, there's there's two different categories, um, and historically we have seen both, right? We have had situations where um, you you were people were fairly happy with the fundamental theory of nature at the point <laughs> in time, and then the muon was discovered, yeah, and people were completely puzzled where this is coming from. Was would solve nothing, but it clearly was there, right? So this is one situation. 
And then there are situations where, and I would rather um, say that we are in a closer to that situation at the moment, where um, the whole fundamental theory leaves open many, many questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, then obviously the first thing to think about is whether one of the um, anomalies, like this measurement, for example, might be a hint to solve one of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that it has to be, but clearly that is where you would um, look first. And, and this is what we're this is what we're kind of trying to do in a way at the moment, isn't it? We're trying to find as many kind of potential cracks and chips in the standard model as we can to try and find out where new physics beyond the standard model might be hiding, because we know it can't be the the last word. It doesn't explain dark matter. It doesn't explain the the CP violation that we think that we think occurred in the early universe. There's lots of we have to put in a lot of parameters by hand, for example. There's lots of questions that we haven't answered with the standard model. But if we can find these little break points where it doesn't quite explain everything, maybe that gives us some idea of where to look for new physics. Yeah, and that is partly why this um, the fact that this happened for the W boson makes it quite attractive or intriguing mm. for theorists. Yeah. Because the W boson is related to many of these things. Yeah. In the beginning, we talked about how without the W boson, the universe would look very, very different. Um, and I mentioned that heavy particles can't decay if the W isn't around. So we, we really have um, like a, a threefold structures that would interact with each other that we don't observe <laughs> in the universe, at least. But also the W is the only particle in the absence of the W, we would never have any process um, observed that distinguishes between meta and antimatter. So the W processes where the W boson takes part are the only processes we know of that can do that job. Yeah. And uh, clearly this is a huge open question as well. It's not clear whether this is directly related to what we see here, but um, we know that the universe mostly consists of matter. And if there was a, um, a, um, an equal distribution of both matter and antimatter in the beginning, um, then it's completely unclear how this could have happened. Where, where did all the antimatter go? Um, and the only party we know that has something to say about this is the W. So you can tell that uh, from a theorist perspective, it is quite intriguing. And there is this kind of, you could call it bias, but there is this kind of um, 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 connection that people make when they see an anomaly like this. One, one obvious question is, is it statistically and systematically, um, uh, is, is the error small enough to make it significant so yeah. we can believe it? Yeah. What do other experiments say? But another one is, how well <laughs> does this work with any theory that could explain yeah, it? Yeah, if you yeah, needed yeah. a very abstract, complicated theory to explain this, and it contradicts three other things that you need to take care of, yeah. it, uh, yeah. it kind of makes it more um, unlikely for this to be true. Not, not saying it couldn't be true, right? When the muon was discovered, a young theorist could have written down the standard model, and it looks very complicated and messy, and people would have said, that looks like, it, it, why would that be the case, right? <laughs> So there, there is some there is some bias there for sure, mm. but if you um, need many 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 parameters to explain something, you can run into this trap that with enough parameters you can explain really everything. Yeah. So the predictivity of, uh, suffers. You really want to see whether what you predict here um, has some connections to some other sector, whether you can test it elsewhere, and whether it makes theoretical sense. And uh, there have been cases also where any solution would completely break what we know. So yeah. here we might learn something about the fundamental nature. But um, if, if you had, like in the past, people thought they had found neutrinos that travel faster than light, right? Yeah. The whole structure of our theory would break down. And that, of course, makes people less likely to believe it if that theory is so so crazy successful elsewhere. I have to, I have to admit, when I, when I saw the CDF measurement, and, and it's, it's unfair, I'm not saying anything about the, the CDF measurement and immediately jump to faster than light neutrinos when I see a huge you know huge sigma measurement but something that seems off compared to every other measurement that we've seen before so we'll see what comes of it but you're right we have a mental bias to jump to these to these certain uh, these certain conclusions um a couple of other things i i saw mentioned um it might have been in your thread actually people talking about things like uh supersymmetry even dark photons parity restoration in weak interactions is there is there any ideas there i know those are three very very different things um yeah, well, uh, supersymmetry of course is still um never uh, dies still it never goes away open quest. Mm -hmm. exactly there's there's not going to be a time one of the main reasons is of course that string theory um works properly if it is a supersymmetric theory and otherwise it's um it's much more complicated to get a consistent um theory of quantum gravity or even a candidate for that 
So um, that that is why, um, especially um, people that are concerned with like the very fundamental layer and quantum gravity theories um, think that a signal of supersymmetry is something we definitely need to look for, no matter how long <laughs> it will take to find it somewhere. And uh, supersymmetry um, at the low energy, from a low energy perspective, can deal with many, many things because it has so many new particles, right? Mm -hmm. So in these loops that we just looked at, yeah. any or many of these particles that you show here on the on the SUSY side yeah. could be responsible for such a split. So um, the, the, it, it is one of these examples where you also have many parameters. So yeah. you need many different contributions to be sure. Mm -hmm. I don't think even if the W mass measurement um, alone is going to be confirmed to be quite off, yeah. that would be a clear hint of supersymmetry by itself. Mm -hmm. Right? People would want to see something else. But um, supersymmetry, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, can do it because of these uh, um, different particles. And the other cases you mentioned, I, I'm, I'm not aware of, um, of all the details, yeah. but um, parity restoration or, or also the question why, for example, is it said that the weak force interacts only with one kind of particles, the left-handed particles, yeah. not with the other kind, yeah. is, um, is a non-understood question. It could just be the case, period. It could just be what nature gave us. <laughs> but it could also be that there is some more complicated mechanism behind similar to the to mm. <coughs> what is responsible for um the w mass in the first place some kind of symmetry breaking mechanism as, yeah. as it uh, is the case for the higgs and then again you would have additional particles that could be um responsible for that and uh, the hidden photon is related to uh, dark matter is one one model where um, the hidden photon could either be the thing that talks to dark matter and the visible sector or it could be something that is the dark matter itself so in, in both cases, because the um, W is charged and the hidden photon um, is, is uh, mixes with a visible photon, you could get effects from that. So it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental, uh, maybe I should say two words to explain this a little bit. So it's a fundamental property in quantum mechanics that if you have two things that you can't distinguish, that they are not, you, you can't sit down and determine whether something is one or the other. Yeah. They always will interfere. So you will not be able to say photon A and photon B are clearly separated and I will always know what they are. Their wave functions overlap and you need to do a measurement. Mm. And something similar happens here. If you had another particle that behaves just like the photon, but not necessarily with electric charge, maybe mm. some hidden charge we don't aware of, one thing it will do is it will mix with the mm. visible photon. So, and, and that mixing makes it appear in diagrams like we have just seen for the W, mm. but also in other experiments. So what you show here is the production of a photon and a hidden photon in the E plus E minus collider. And there you would um, in principle be able to see such a photon, for example, if it is then decaying into E plus E minus again. So that would be a direct search for that. That's an example of what we just talked about, right? That's the next step. You have figured out this yeah. could resolve this issue with the W boson. <laughs> so what is the consequence of that? And yeah. This would be an example for if it was a hidden photon, this would be one way to search for it. And this would be an ex experimental signature. You see these E plus E minus collision. And then you see a displaced vertex where you where you get this decay to an E plus E minus away from that interaction. And maybe we can yeah. infer that this uh, that this dark photon, quote unquote, was there. So so this is this is very much the, the cycle we're in now, isn't it? Understanding that tension between those measurements. If we believe that this is a, a real value, thinking of um, theories that could explain it and then thinking about experimental techniques that could probe which of those theories are, are accurate. That's sort of the the um the 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 cycle we're in now isn't it yeah that that is one part of it and the other side obviously is for the experimentalists to really pay attention to the details and yeah. see um, how much they can trust the two measurements and there's also um i mean cms and atlas are still taking data the yeah. collaborations that work at the large hadron collider yeah. and they will produce their own updated w mass measurements yeah. and it will be very important to see whether those start to shift over mm. or whether the tension increases with the CDF measurement. Mm. But yeah, these are the two um, directions in which we will go now. The, the experimentalists mainly will be concerned with um, understanding whether something has been overlooked, mm. whether there's some uncertainty, which could also be, by the way, in the electric fit. So yeah. it could be that data and electric fit have a, have a shift and the error has been um, underestimated. That would also um, reduce the significance. Um, quite a bit, but but um, that is one direction. The other direction is if you take it serious, if in the end you just make a guess and say that the W mass is eventually going to be different in these two different ways of obtaining it, 
what could be responsible and how can we find it. Mm -hmm. And that's quite exciting because like what you just showed, this way of producing a hidden photo has absolutely nothing to do with even the experiment <laughs> that measured the double trans, right? Yeah. So that, that's the work of a, of a theorist working in phenomenology. You need yeah. not only to know how to do the calculations to explain it, yeah. now you have to figure out what would be the best way to directly confirm um, what I suspect is responsible for that. And this is that this is the nice interplay between the people. People tend to speak of them in, in you know, in different breaths, the experimentalists and the theorists. But there's this interplay continuously. The experimentalists see something. How do we explain it with theory? The theorists have an idea. How could we exp how could we go look for that and, and clarify that that theory actually operates in nature? There's there's such a <clears throat> excuse me, such a tight interaction between them in reality that. It's kind of a, a a bit of an arbitrary line between them. They they interact and and uh, work together so closely that um that uh you know all the all the all the nice little competition we have between each other is it's not really real. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it, well the line is arbitrary, but it's also like the I, I there are experiments I could never possibly work on. Like <laughs> I had it was on a workshop this week. With people that work at HCB, that's uh, your your old collaboration, as I understand as well. And when you when you listen to them discussing these different details that go into um, the way they they perform these analysis, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, this is just the the would be impossible to have people doing both these things at the same time. Yeah. Right? It's it's a it's a good separation of labor in the sense <laughs> that we make better progress this way. Exactly. I believe um, just just before we we finish now, I believe you've. You've been uh, having fun getting involved with the experimental side with this this new um, experiment Anubis, which we might discuss next week. So, how have you how have you enjoyed getting involved with more on the experimental side? Yeah, this is because this is not um, within an established collaboration where um, all these things are clearly separated from theorists' eyes. Um, during our collaboration meeting for this, and we will talk next week, um, yeah. I, I suppose, what it is and how it works. Yeah, yeah. But just, just yeah. this aspect, I, I have much closer uh, insight in what are the questions, how do we make progress, how do we get this to run <laughs> in the first place? Yeah. And uh, it, it's really fun to observe this. It's, it's really cool to see this from my perspective. Amazing. Professor Barr, I've had a, a great time, That's I've, and I've learned a hell of a lot. I think, uh, I think people will really enjoy hearing about that because we talked last week to to Mika and to um, Professor Toback about the experimental side. Now we've got a little bit more of an insight into the, into the theory side. And I think that's a really nice, um, a nice combination that people will enjoy. So thank you so much for, for taking the time today to explain that to me and go through that with me. That was really, really awesome. Um, is there anywhere where you would like to, to point people to go to, to find out more about this, to, to get more information about particle physics theory? What are the cool theories that are going on or, or being pushed at the moment? Anywhere you'd like to, to send people? So, yeah, um, uh, of course, if you want, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. I will always share what I find uh, yeah. interesting. Exactly. But there are many places online um, and uh, um, many great pages. This this W boson thing is not going to be underreported. There will be enough uh, <laughs> uh, resources to find this online if you want. Okay. I enjoyed the talk quite a bit, I, I must say. I think you, you, you really are in a niche here where you um, uh, go into quite some technical detail and you don't step back from these questions um, that are usually, or oftentimes, um, you get to a certain point and then it stops because people don't are too afraid or don't, don't expect their listeners to be um, interested in these technical details. And I, I really quite enjoy that you I, don't do I, that. I will admit, sometimes it... It stops me getting things out as quick as I would like to because I'm too scared that I didn't understand it completely correctly. Um, but I do like to give the the listeners out there a lot of a lot of sort of credit because I think, as you said, a lot of people will they'll give the main the main headlines. You know, this thing is too big. That means the standard model might be in trouble. Blah blah blah. And it's like my old question is always that, and I'm and I'm biased of course because I'm an old particle physicist. But my my question is always why and how and how are we going to go a bit further and and for that you know unfortunately fortunately you need to dive into some of the the technical detail and i think i think people people enjoy that and uh you know as long as you don't go too horrible and technical i think i think people are happy to to go with you so uh yeah i think they'll, they'll yeah. enjoy this and uh and next week yeah. if we talk about anubis i think they'll uh they'll enjoy that as well i particularly enjoy the mixing of science and ancient egyptian myth as well so uh That'll be yeah. that'll be a nice one. 
<laughs> so, Professor Bath, thank you so much again. I know you've got a, a, a busy Friday ahead, so I will I will let you go. Let's uh, let's stay in contact, and then hopefully we can have a chat about Anubis next week. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you I very much. Back to you. An absolute pleasure. Take care, buddy, and have a have an excellent weekend. Yes, you too. Bye now. Bye. I want to know what you think because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.